Thank you very much to everyone who's joined for the inaugural lecture today. I really appreciate it. Um, it does feel a little bit strange to be presenting the lecture only over the video conference today um, and not be able to thank you all um, personally for being here. But I think it's also um, quite a fitting representation of academic life over the last um, year or so, which has mostly been conducted um, over the BC. So I'm uh, joining you from my study um, in my home, um, where I've spent the best part of the last um, 13 months. And it's from here that we're going to take a journey through some of the rural landscapes and places in Scotland um, that I've been lucky enough to live and work within uh, during my uh, rural health uh, research. So I'm going to talk about some physical places, um, towns, villages, beaches, woodlands, and I'm going to explore some of the ways in which they connect to our health and well-being. So I'll talk about health as something that we experience as individuals and also in relation to our interactions with healthcare services uh, providers. So this um, the first image here is a view of the Strathmore Valley in Angus in the Scottish Lowlands. And I like to start a lot of my presentations with a picture of this rural landscape um, because it's the one in which I grew up. And I've been thinking about um, why I like to do that. And I think it's because this image uh, grounds me and it reminds me why I care about rural communities and it gives me a positive feeling of belonging. So this landscape has an emotional connection for me. It's this agricultural landscape around Angus and the Mairns that gives me a sense of calm, um, a sense of home, and of peace, of being um, in my place. So I like things, uh, for example, like the brown of the tilled earth, um, the silhouette, of the trees and the fields, um, the way the light uh, comes through the clouds, the lilac blue of the sky, um, the green, the golden of the crops in the fields um, as it makes the, the land makes its way towards the sea. So I guess it's not uh, surprising that as a geographer, um, I have this fascination with place and with people's connection to land and landscape. But I think my first um, inklings that there may be this emotional connection with land started for me in and around Angus and Mairns. So I uh, ended up doing a undergraduate degree, a uh, master's and a PhD in geography at the University of Dundee, so not far from those um, rural landscapes I grew up in. And I think that uh, geography as a subject first appealed to me because I felt I could literally see it all around me. Um, geography seemed like a wonderfully applied subject to me. It seemed to not only offer explanations for why physical landscapes were distributed in certain ways, but also it seemed to offer explanations for why society and culture and people um, differ and are different over space. So it was really this opportunity to attempt to understand the social world around me that really drew me into geography. So even though I knew um, pretty early on that I didn't want to be a physical geographer, like a hydrologist or a geomorphologist, I wanted to be a human geographer. Um, I think my studies at Dundee really helped me to understand as well that the connections between human and physical geography are really um, inextricable. So the things that I wanted to understand, for example, were why uh, humans interacted with physical landscapes in different ways, how humans shape landscape, but also how landscape can shape us uh, right back as, as people. And over time, I was drawn to uh, thinking about this specifically in relation to those landscapes or places that contain natural features and might be described uh, as rural. So after um, graduating with my PhD, uh, 2007, I came north 
uh, to what was then the UHI Millennium Institute, so the precursor to our university. Uh, and this is what really gave me the opportunity to pursue rural health research. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time um, with UHI in uh, the building you can see um, in the slide just now, the Centre for Health Science, um, which is in the beautiful city of Inverness um, in the Highlands. And it was uh, a couple of years later, so in, in 2009, that I felt um, I was really uh, lucky within UHI because the then Professor um, of Rural Health, uh, Professor Jane Farmer, took uh, the chance to bring me into her rural health research team. Um, and working for Jane um, was demanding, but also very exciting, and connected me to research topics around community engagement and co-production that I've continued to pursue. Um, and being Jane's colleague has also allowed me to uh, visit and work um, for periods of time within a very different rural landscape uh, within Australia, uh, where Jane is now a professor um, at Swinburne University. So after um, this, this bit of background, um, I'd like to move into thinking about these connections that I've mentioned between health and place and start to think about why these connections might exist. So needless to say, this relationship is really complex. And there are lots of factors that are place specific that can affect our physical and mental health and our general sense of well-being. So living or working within a particular environment can expose you to certain health risks whilst protecting you from others. So some of the features of place that are associated with health um, in the research literature are things like environmental factors, like climate and temperature, economic factors around employment um, and income that might be tied to place-based industry, for example, uh, multiple deprivation that can be compounded in place and across generations, social and cultural norms around help-seeking behaviours and perceptions of risk, and physical access to things like healthcare services and nutritional food. And there also are also our emotional and historical and cultural connections to place um, that are associated with health. So thinking about some of these things specifically within rural contexts, some of the features here that are associated with health in the literature are things like extreme environmental events like bushfire and flooding, uh, fuel poverty and economic factors like seasonal or land-based work, physical distance from healthcare services, the normalization of potentially risky behaviors, social isolation within dispersed populations, and also the visibility of illness within small communities. So today I'd like to reflect on some of the ways that I've seen rurality and rural community to be interlinked with health. And to do that, I'd like to reflect on themes that have emerged for me out of the qualitative research that I've been involved with over the last 14 years or so. And this work is primarily involved speaking with people who live or work within rural areas and that's through methods such as interviewing, focus groups and participant observation, and then analysing the textual data that's been collected through those methods. So the vast majority of the work that I'll reflect on today has been carried out within the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. And rather than go into particular detail of any individual study, I'd like to talk about the themes that for me straddle these different pieces of work. And I think these themes are important for the academic study of rural health, but also for the design and the delivery of health interventions and health services within rural areas. So the first thing that I'd like to consider within this context is thinking about rural landscapes, nature and the outdoors. 
So geographers talk about certain landscapes as being therapeutic. And that means that people think of these landscapes as associated with processes of healing, so physical, mental and emotional healing. And landscapes that are thought of as rural or natural and containing natural features are often one of the key types of therapeutic landscape. And these can be things like our gardens, our urban parks, um, but also our forests, our beaches, lakes, mountains, countryside. And these have been increasingly categorised by geographers according to their colours or their palettes of place. For example, the green spaces of our forests and woodlands, the blue spaces of our coasts and rivers, and even the white spaces of our ice and snow. So many of the types of landscape that we find within our rural areas are by this type of definition, potentially associated with notions of healing. But much of the research about these processes has focused on the consumption of rural areas by urban and suburban populations. And these studies show that people who are coming into rural areas to participate in things like nature-based interventions or environmental volunteering do experience therapeutic effects and improvements to both mental and physical health. And studies also show restorative effects for those coming to undertake leisure activities within rural landscapes. So I think that this is really valuable research, but it hides a potentially dangerous exclusion. And that's consideration of how those who work and live within rural environments connect with this type of therapeutic space. So in my qualitative research with rural workers and rural residents, I've observed that the relationship between land, landscape, health and well-being can be different for those people who live and work within the rural spaces. And that's what I'd like to reflect upon firstly in this section of the lecture. The first theme that I'll talk about is what I would call the mitigating effect of employment. So for some, this effect is about the impact of land-based work, such as forestry, fishing or farming. And when speaking to rural residents engaged in these types of land-based activity, they do often talk about feeling lucky or feeling privileged to work within landscapes that they think are beautiful. But when speaking about those landscapes, it's also apparent that they are unavoidably tied up with notions that are also not particularly therapeutic. So things like toil and labour, discomfort, endurance, risk, stress, and often low pay and fragile employment. And when these associations become ingrained in one's perception of a landscape, it can be really hard for that landscape to simultaneously be experienced as restorative in the therapeutic sense. So I think that one's feelings towards a rural landscape and one's relationship with a rural landscape can be different when your livelihood is embedded within it and that it's in, it, when it's intimately tied to the sustainability of your employment and by extension, the sustainability of your way of life for your community. And this relationship can be affected further by things like climate change and extreme weather events. So the conversations that I had, for example, in rural Australia with residents around uh, bushfire, particularly those that are known as the Black Saturday um, bushfires in Victoria are ones that will stay with me um, forever. But in, in Scotland too, um, trauma is experienced and its effects can be sustained within rural communities that have experienced things, for example, like flooding events. And people talk here about the potential for future extreme weather as a constant low level anxiety. So these um, impacts and, and other changes related to land-based work can have quite negative mental health impacts. And these can be seen to ripple out into the communities 
connected to those who work the land. Other uh, rural residents' uh, relationships with landscape uh, are impacted by what I would call um, another mitigating effect, that of the consumption of the rural land. So whilst rural, uh, many rural communities rely on leisure and tourism based um, industry, this too can be quite labour intensive, low paid and, and fragile employment. And this has played out for me in some really interesting conversations as part of qualitative work with people who live surrounded by natural landscapes um, that they watch being consumed by others. So they talk about seeing the landscape as something that's for tourists and not something that they consider to be for their own use, for their health and well-being. So as they watch these landscapes being consumed for leisure, it can become bound up with processes of othering, notions of elitism, a sense of a loss of control, a loss of connection, and, and almost a sense of grief at the commercialization of the rural land. So people have talked about living beside or living within uh, green or even white spaces and knowing that they're potentially health enhancing, but that they don't use these spaces for things like walking or running um, or even more, more passive res restorative activities. And when they talk about the decision making processes around these behaviours, it suggests that they're at least in part linked to a sense that it's not legitimate for them to, to use these spaces, that they lack some sense of ownership or the notion that these are their spaces and their land to use as well. So for me, this um, notion of legitimacy of use is really interesting. <clears throat> and it ties to other qualitative work that, in which I've spoken to rural residents who do consciously use the outdoors for health and well-being. And this is uh, sometimes people who have purposefully moved to areas like the Highlands because they want to live within an area where they can easily engage in outdoor leisure activities. But I think it'd be, um, it'd be disingenuous to say that all other rural residents' therapeutic experience or use of the outdoors is mitigated by land-based work or tourism, because there is evidence that rural landscapes, including natural features like woodland and beaches, are experienced as therapeutic for some rural residents. So in talking about this, I'd like to draw on qualitative work with uh, Scottish rural residents who were not land-based workers, but who did use local green and blue spaces for physical activity, mainly for walking. So when talking to these residents about their use of spaces such as woodlands or riverbank walks, they often described an awareness of how walking in nature had an added benefit for them to their mental health of reducing stress and enhancing feelings of well-being. But these people also talked about how the green and the blue spaces contrasted to the environments in which they carried out their paid employment on a daily basis. And these were spaces like schools and hospitals and offices. So for this group of residents, their responses were much more aligned to those that were reported by the urban and the suburban populations uh, conducting activity in rural landscapes. They talked about things, for example, like peacefulness, and biodiversity um, and the sounds um, of nature. But something else that I think is really interesting uh, within this group of rural residents is that they also talked about added well-being from feelings of nostalgia that were generated within these green and blue spaces. So for many within uh, this group that we talked to, these green and blue spaces were ones that invoked happy childhood memories, particularly ones around exploration and using these spaces for play. So for these residents, the spaces that they walk um, or run through now for leisure um, or exercise are not spaces of labour or toil, 
or of tourism, but they were very much conceptualised as part of their geographical rural community. The way that they talked about these spaces showed that they were very much embedded within a local consciousness as spaces for the community to use, and that they were associated with these notions of nostalgia. So I think that perception of the rural as a therapeutic landscape differs according to the individual's construction of meaning based on their own lived experience. So thinking a bit more about this uh, group that we spoke to, these rural residents, and in particular, I'm going to reflect on how they spoke about their use of a community woodland and, and a local river space. And it became apparent that doing things like walking or running or cycling through these spaces, it engaged both notions of their corporeal health, so exercise and sensory pleasure, but also of non-corporeal satisfaction. So things like personal engagement with history, with ecology, tranquility and reflection. So for these community members, an additional dimension of this therapeutic experience was the connection of these spaces to their individual and their collective memories. So we could see that pleasurable nostalgia was acting as a mechanism through which the therapeutic interaction with the space was enacted. It was what encouraged residents to feel connected to these places. So seeing other community members use the space speaking to them about it, sharing their memories, or simply saying hello within these spaces, all contributed to fostering feelings of belonging and ultimately a place attachment. So for these community members, the individual green and blue spaces were very much experienced as part of a wider therapeutic environment that consisted of local paths, wooded and green areas and waterways places where they traditionally gone for walks and played with children. So for them, I think it appears to be the coming together of both the natural features and the sense of belonging that generated the therapeutic experience. So there's no straightforward association between rural landscape and health enhancement or therapeutic experience. I think the experience of the therapeutic landscape is mediated by the personal context in which it's lived. But when considering whether rural landscapes are being used for health and wellbeing benefit, I think we need to consider these different types of attachment that people have to place. And this might involve understanding how rural residents and communities can enhance their own feelings of ownership and that they're allowed to use these spaces. So this will involve not only addressing what might be physical barriers to access, but also what might be seen as more social or cultural barriers to access. The type of um, use of, of landscape that we've looked at so far is, if you like, self-instigated or self-organised. And another aspect um, of my work has engaged with more organised or led activities within rural landscapes and green spaces. And such outdoor, um, usually nature-based interventions um, are carried out often in small groups and include things like community gardening, conservation activities, walking groups or cycling groups. And these um, interventions too have shown that there can be physical and mental health improvements for the rural people taking part, although the research into this has been relatively small scale. The people taking part in these types of organised activities often have underlying health conditions, usually ones that have been diagnosed by a healthcare professional. So much is made about harnessing the power of nature, um, the outdoors and the rural landscape for the pr promotion of health and well-being, um, not least within 
policy. I think that facilitating this through everyday behaviours um, on one hand and through structured lead activity on the other really needs to um, take into account an understanding of the different ways in which rural people have these contemporary and historical connections to nature, to landscape and to place. And so I'd like to turn in the second part of the lecture um, to the other main area um, of my work. And this is about how communities and rural residents interact with healthcare services. So it might seem like um, a bit of a shift from what we've just been talking about. But for me, understanding these interactions between rural communities and statutory services is actually linked to several um, of the same themes that we see in the landscape work. And these are things around, for example, sense of belonging, of place, sense of identity, um, and notions of the fragility of rural communities, as well as their historical and cultural memory. So I would argue that rural community engagement with things like services planning and with services usage is tied to understandings of place and to notions of community sustainability. So one of the areas in which I have um, started to look at these relationships is in relation to rural communities who are experiencing services change um, within primary care or their, their community services. So I've taken part in work that's tried to examine the degree to which different rural communities and rural residents feel that they've been actively involved um, or meaningfully involved in these um, discussions of change. And this is in a context in which uh, statutory services providers are really increasingly looking to work with communities and involve communities in planning um, and design. But the research um, suggests that without a social and cultural and historical knowledge of the rural communities, it's really hard to do this in a meaningful way. So I would argue that place really matters in rural health services planning um, and that that's not just in spatial terms. So some of our work um, within this area has involved qualitative work with communities in the Highlands and Islands um, that are experiencing primary care services change um, at the same time, although they were experiencing different types of, of change within the different communities. Um, in each of the communities that we worked with, there were statutory providers who were conducting community engagement processes that they designed in order to engage residents within services planning. And we found that when talking about their experience of taking part, there were much higher levels of satisfaction or positive experiences in some communities in comparison to others. And satisfaction tended to be higher in communities where discussions of change didn't involve the closure of GP surgery space. So retention of a local healthcare space, even one which had greatly reduced opening hours, was associated with greater community satisfaction with the change process itself. So when people talked to us about this across the different communities, we could see that some form of retaining a physical, dedicated healthcare space within the community was intertwined with residents' feelings around a sense of reassurance that a local service would be maintained into the future. So the presence of a dedicated healthcare space became tied to residents' understandings of their own community as valuable and viable and sustainable. And some words that stick with me were a person saying, as long as there's a GP surgery here, it proves that we're still a viable community. And any change 
or, or suggestion of change to the physical presence of a dedicated healthcare space within their community was viewed as scary and potentially undermining to the sustainability of their community and to their and their family's way of life. So I think it's very difficult for any community engagement or design method to successfully deal with this kind of deep-seated fear um, within some rural communities. And I think it's also one reason why some of our qualitative studies show rural communities and rural service planners or managers can have different opinions about the same community engagement process and they can talk about the same community engagement process in very different ways. Sometimes we saw community members viewing an engagement as negative and planners and managers viewing the same one as having been successful. And I'd argue that this is at least partly related to two different understandings um, or of place or perspectives on place. So while there can be a tendency for planners and managers to see rural places from the outside as a geographical container for a population that needs to be served, rural residents view their communities as meaningful social entities. So when they talk to us, ma managers and planners often focus on methods of engagement. The things that are important in their narratives are how they've made efforts to physically visit rural communities, to offer the chance to come forward and discuss models of delivery um, that they feel are viable. And planners and managers can become frustrated when community members seem to react negatively so what they thought were legitimate engagement methods and legitimate options for change. I think what might not be apparent to the, the, the planners and managers is why discussing these topics is linked to an emotional response by the rural citizens. And these emotional reactions are related to what appears to be a threat to community sustainability. So when thinking through service delivery options, Rural residents are thinking about times when they have experienced illness or their family members or their neighbours have been ill. They're thinking about whether they'll still be able to grow old within their own locality and about whether their community will shrink or even cease to exist without place-based healthcare provision. Again, another comment that sticks with me from um, a community member was when they said statutory providers should be more honest and try to discover and discuss people's greatest fears. I think that person was really onto something and that this mention of fear is really important. I think on trying to understand these fears really takes time and also an awareness of the social and cultural and the healthcare history within particular places. Doing that type of engagement isn't easy. And in our quality to work with um, healthcare professionals and planners and managers, we can see that despite an awareness of the value of community engagement, discourses can revert to a position in which rural communities um, are seen as these spatial entities. So containers of bodies that are to be served and that are devoid of a social, cultural or historical context. And in some of the communities where we've seen the lower levels of satisfaction with services change and community engagement, that type of discourse can be particularly prominent. And these are ways of talking that position the public as unknowing, particularly around things like budgetary or logistical constraints. Within community discourses in these areas, there's often also a theme of being ground down by successive rounds of consultation. So a feeling that community members give their opinions time and again, but it doesn't actually influence statutory service decisions. 
and important too are the way in which people talk to us about successive um, service provision staff not being aware of what consultations or engagement have gone before. But I do think it's really difficult to enact community engagement in small rural communities where residents can be fearful of change, particularly because they see it as the withdrawal of a valued service that underpins their identity as a community. We have spoken to people who think smaller uh, primary care practices do this type of engagement better. And interestingly, they talk about that because they see smaller practices as viewing themselves as part of the community, not as a service provider to the community. But rural uh, community members have talked to us about more positive experiences as well um, in terms of successful community engagement. And they talk about um, these processes as ones which do have this understanding and awareness of what's gone before within the community. They also talk about these engagements as being ones um, which understand why particular subjects might be difficult for them to talk about and why those things might be difficult. So understanding these aspects of place, I think can enable planners and managers to negotiate things like pressure points and tensions within communities that might otherwise be inflamed by engagement processes. So things that people have said are successful were thinking about the timing of engagement activities, their content, the methods used, the topics discussed, and understanding that social, cultural and healthcare history within place-based communities. So I think that engagement that's devoid of this understanding of place in its widest sense can be one of the things that makes some rural communities resistant to engagement or to experience it in more negative ways. And I would argue that there are indeed social determinants of engagement, um, much in the same way that there are social determinants of health. And that in rural communities, these determinants of engagement can be very place-based. In other words, the conditions in which we are born, we grow, we live, we work, we age, influence the way in which we engage with statutory providers and their processes of design and consultation. And one way in which my research has tried to explore these determinants has been through a process known as deep mapping. So this is a creative, co-productive, qualitative research process, which uh, really focuses on working with community members so that they can identify and present the stories, and the information that's important to them. So by working with this type of community generated information, healthcare planners can obtain insights into things like shifts in the social, economic and cultural contexts in place over time. I think this is one way of bringing into the planning process the types of data that are important to citizens but might have remained peripheral um, so far within statutory engagement process. But I also think that these types of social determinant also affect the ways in which rural people actually use healthcare provision. So rural dwellers can be hesitant to seek help from healthcare services for many of the reasons that we've touched on already. And that includes things like economic fragility, fear of engaging in behaviours that will be detrimental to rural community resilience, uh, not least taking time away from, from work for, to travel for treatment. But when I look at the ways in which rural people have spoken to me about how and why they use healthcare services or, or don't use them, I think it also links to place attachment. And this particularly comes out for me when talking to people in rural areas who are either receiving treatment for mental ill health or waiting to receive such treatment. So when people have to travel for mental health treatment and they talk about that um, therapy or recovery 
um, happening elsewhere. They often talk about this um, need to need to travel, need to move in negative terms, and that's not just about the inconvenience of the travel um, or the fear of impacting um, on their family, emotional and economic stability. It's it's also a discourse that talks about divorcing the very act of treatment or recovery from the landscape and the everyday spaces in which their lives have to be carried out. Again, some words from a, a participant that stay with me. She said, why is my treatment outside over there when my life is here? I go to the mainland to get better, but I then have to come back here to my life. So I think there's something really powerful about literally feeling that experience of healing or recovery with what, within one's own rural locality, especially for those people experiencing mental ill health. And that's one reason why I'm also particularly interested in recent initiatives around things like social prescribing and the local provision of initiatives like nature-based um, interventions by the charitable and voluntary sector. I think part of their success or part of their potential for success is that they bring this healing process into the rural community itself. And that helps to tie notions of recovery within the consciousness of rural residents with the everyday landscapes within which those people live and work. So of course, this needs to be done as well with a recognition that people can sometimes be hesitant to be seen to be accepting help or receiving treatment within small rural communities. And people do talk about this effect of living in a goldfish bowl um, and the visibility of ill health within rural communities. But on the other hand, the same communities can be experienced as supportive or close knit or even offering a buffer against mental ill health. So where does all this take us to? Well, I think rurality and health and well-being and people are endless, endlessly complicated and intriguing and fascinating and challenging to understand. Um, I think our rural areas are going to continue to face challenges, some of which we've touched upon today, um, but other uh, new challenges, not least from the longer term impacts of the current pandemic. With the move to much more ubiquitous online healthcare consultation and online community engagement, there are lots more questions for us to ask around how the use of technology will interact with a sense of rural place and rural identity. So I hope I've given a bit of an insight this afternoon as to why those of us who engage in rural health research really need to also engage with a consideration of the social, the cultural and the historical dimensions of rural place and rural identity. And so we'll just finish back where we started in uh, Angus and the Mairns. And I will say thank you once again for being here and for listening this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah Ann, for taking us on that tremendous rural journey through the landscape and our connections and the importance of our rural healthcare services and for posing some challenges for us in, in how we interact with the community and how we deliver these services. And it's easy to see how you've inspired so many junior re uh, researchers and students to pursue careers in, in rural health research. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the um, question says we've got time for a few questions if that's all right. So um, just starting at the top, I mean, I'm just going through it in terms of the, the out, um, line of your lecture. So looking at a question about young people in rural areas, the specific health needs and inequalities, that population group, is that something you maybe say a few words on? Uh, thank you, Sandra. I think um, something that, that I guess sticks in my mind um, from a qualitative research is um, those discussions around um, mental health and well-being for young people. Um, it's certainly something that um, community members often highlight um, as a challenge. There's lots of anxiety, I think, um, about um, 
young people's uh, mental health, particularly over the last um, 12 months, um, and how we can support people, uh, young people living in rural communities um, with their, their mental wellbeing um, and access to services. So I think that's um, a particular challenge that it would be um, really worthwhile to be yeah, uh, looking at um, at the moment. Thank you. I'm just going to take the next two questions together because one's really a comment and one's more of a question. One's just about working in a in a in a lovely rural area, but not actually have the time to 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 get the benefits or particularly the therapeutic benefits of it. And somebody has just posed a question, which you've alluded to, I think, in in your talk around the idea of urban areas and rural areas, and is it better to be living in a rural area next to wildlife? Um, or for urban people to come to a rural area, which is healthier. I'm not sure if that's something you can answer directly, but it's an interesting question. It is. It's, it, it's really complex, and I think um, it's it's partly about um, difference for me. Is it's one of the things that's come out in that qualitative research. So, um, the experience of people who live in a rural area but are 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 not working within that environment um, can be quite similar to those people from urban areas who come to visit the landscape. Um, I think one of the other in interesting things is that there's a potential seasonal um, aspect there as well, um, and that um, some people in rural areas talk about having more opportunity um, to use the landscape in the summertime. Um, when we've got more lights, obviously, up here in the north of Scotland. Um, but then there's also challenges around um, negotiating that landscape when it's um, busy with tourists as well. And sometimes, um, actually, you can get out and enjoy it a bit more in the winter. I've got loads of questions here. Um, I should say we might not get around to all of them, but we'll try and get back to you all at some point um, after the talk. We're just moving on a little bit about the healthcare services. So. Um, Question around, you know, statute providers and engaging with the rural um, population, um, how to address their fears and and their um, worries about the change in in healthcare services, and what what might be the first step in in um, approaching that? Is it about actually acknowledging their fears in the first place, or how, how might we go about it? Yes, I think that's really important. I think that. Um, it needs to be, from my opinion, it needs to be seen as um, an ongoing process. So more than uh, just a kind of dip in, dip out engagement. Like actually, we're speaking to rural communities in a in a more longitudinal way um, over time, and we're actually recording, um, you know, our organisational memory around how we engage with these communities. I think would be really important. Um, I think one of the other things that 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 question kind of makes me think about is how um, often there's also a difference between what frontline staff, if you like, working in rural communities say to us, as opposed to those um, who are more um, managerial or based in kind of headquarters um, would say. And and there's a real opportunity, I think, to get those rural healthcare professionals that are embedded within communities actually um, designing processes and carrying out processes. How can we support them to do that? Because I think that sometimes they want to, um, but feel potentially stifled or, or they don't have the tools to be doing that. So um, I think there's a, yeah, an opportunity there to, to engage with them more. There's a couple of questions here. I'm just going to take one is around um, just some of the population. So somebody's asking about People with particular problems such as dementia and how they might engage with discussions, and then another one around long-term residence as opposed to short-term or visiting residence. I guess so. These are people, two different groups of people, as well as, I guess, the dementia is part of the long-term community. How, how their views are important in terms of looking at these services. Absolutely, and I think. We need to be really cognizant of that, that rural communities are diverse um, and that people are going to be prepared to engage in different ways. So having a suite of options, I think, is is you know something really important to think about. Um, when we when we speak to like one rural community, you know, there'll be people who say there's no way I'm gonna stand up in the village hall and tell you my opinion, but I'd be quite happy to do it. 
in a written way or in a digital way or in a one to one way. So I think trying to offer people a breadth of options um, to engage is also going to be um, the first way, I suppose, to, to try and gather those opinions from, from the different people. Thank you. The question here about, um, I guess it's about recruitment and retention, really about the fact that local services are very important in these rural communities, but it's challenging to keep the staffing up. Um, if you may want to comment on that. Yeah, it can be. And I think that's um, obviously that's a problem in itself and it's an area of research in itself as well. Um, but I think if we, it, it, it helps, I think, to think about um, what we've talked about in terms of fears and what, what actually reassures rural communities. Um, and it, it, it's when you have these more in-depth discussions, it, it might start out as being, I need to have a doctor here to make me feel secure. But if you interrogate what that actually means and, and what it is they actually need in terms of the assurance, there might be um, other ways um, of providing that to rural communities. Um, and I think one area that I find really interesting is this notion that having a healthcare space actually makes them feel um, reassured. So whether that healthcare space has to be staffed or not is, is another question. It could actually be a space in which people um, potentially engage through um, digital technology with their healthcare professional. But just the fact that it's there within their community and it's theirs and their, it's theirs to own. Um, can uh, generate those, those that sense of, of reassurance um, that previously was associated with the physical presence of the person. Thank you. And the question around, you mentioned technology there, but with the government trying to increase rural areas for upgrades for broadband, cellular networks, etc., do you think that's going to have an impact on on these communities if we're more, moving more services online, such as for mental health, etc.? Yes, I think it can be positive. Um, I think in some ways, technology can offer that option for people to experience um, recovery um, and uh, that experience of, of getting well within their rural community. Um, but there is yeah, the recognition that it's not for everyone. But I think the more options we have for rural communities, the better. So I would see that yeah, as a positive thing. Yeah, I'm just going to take one final question. Uh, and just, and it's been in the news recently, but the Apple Cross community withdrawing from the North Coast 500, and wondering, you know, what insights there might be into the community and how they might manage such impacts. And I think that's really about the tourism impact. Really, that's the question. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because, like, I guess, like many aspects of what we've talked about today, there's like a positive and the negative um, side to it. Um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but um, when I, I guess from, from thinking about healthcare change, when communities um, have a space in which they can discuss these things and work together um, and build on their assets in a way that works for them, then that's going to hopefully bring kind of the most positive outcome for them. Okay, thank you, Sarah, Anna, and thank you for a few questions there. Um, so, Sarah, Anna, Professor Manoz, it's my my very great pleasure to welcome you to join the University of the Highlands and Islands Profes Professoriate, and you join the growing panel. And I'm resisting the temptation to use a derogatory description for professors here, but of over fifty professors in the university, uh, and you're our first and only professor of rural health. You mentioned. Um, Professor Farmer, who of course worked for the University of Aberdeen. So you're our first university professor in Highlands and Islands, um, specifically in rural health. And as you've outlined, it's a subject area of um, increasing significance, and we've heard very eloquently about that um, today. So becoming a professor is one of the highest levels of academic achievement awarded to individuals in recognition of the excellence um, they've de delivered in their work. And I think you've earned that accolade through your internationally recognised research as a social scientist and human geographer, and the strong impact that your work has had within our rural communities, and we've heard about that today. But also your external engagement, and you mentioned something like that, you, that spans continents from Africa to Australia with a 
a stop off in Northern Europe as well for some of your work. Um, all of which has contributed substantially to the reputational value of the university. And your vision and strategic leadership um, of the Division of Rural Health and Wellbeing under your stewardship, I have to say, of the last couple of years um, will really influence the direction and, and outputs um, of the School of Health and the university indeed as we move forward into the next important stages of development. And we're here virtually today. It's been a difficult year for all of us. And you alluded to how you're working your study. We're doing our, our lectures and much of our research um, um, remotely. But it's been an auspicious year in other ways. And the university has been celebrating its 10th anniversary. And as well as yourself gaining your chair, you've had a milestone birthday this very week. So happy birthday, Sarah Ann. You did lose something important, of course, this week. And that was your voice. So. <laughs> Um, it was a bit touch and go at the last minute whether you'd actually be able to deliver this lecture, but thankfully you've regained it to our, to our very great benefit. So thank you again, uh, Professor Sarah Ann Manoz, and many congratulations on your chair in rural health. So finally, um, I'd like to thank our audience for attending today and um, for your contributions, lively virtual discussion. Um, and. We will get back to any questions that have been answered um, from the chat here. Um, I just like to indicate the next university inaugural lecture will be delivered by Professor Alexander Mark in September. And you'll see the title of that lecture up on your screen at the moment. So thank you everyone and goodbye from us in the University of the Highlands and Islands. <laughs>